Father, thank you for the exquisite goodness of this moment of being together and singing to you, praising you as the King of kings, as well as our tender, loving Father. We praise you, and we pray this in the name of Jesus, your Son, our King. Amen. Uh, you can have a seat. Good morning. Uh, I'm Dan Seitz. Great to have you here. I'm excited to be with you for the launch of a new message series. Uh, when I was in fifth grade, uh, my mom, who was my fifth grade teacher in the public school, uh, put this Shel Silverstein book in my hands, and uh, I thought that the poems inside were some of the funniest things that I had ever read, and not much has changed. Uh, many of you are familiar with Silverstein. Uh, here is a test, catchphrase style, okay? Sarah Cynthia Sylvia Stout would not take the garbage out. Good job, Meredith. You're the only one who knew. <laughs> Man. Anyway, very good job. That's right. That's one of Silverstein's gems. Uh, Sarah Cynthia Sylvia Stout would not take the garbage out. It goes on from there. But here are two lesser known Silverstein gems. Uh, these are two of my favorites. Uh, this one's called Pancake, and I, I love it. It goes this way. Who wants a pancake? Sweet and piping hot. Good little Grace looks up and says, I'll take the one on top. Who else wants a pancake? Fresh off the griddle. Terrible Teresa smiles and says, I'll take the one in the middle. Okay? That's going to be a tough kid. Tough teenager right there. Okay? But here's my favorite one. Snowball. Snowball. I love this. goes this way. I made myself a snowball, as perfect as could be. I thought I'd keep it as a pet and let it sleep with me. I made it some pajamas and a pillow for its head. Then last night it ran away, but first it wet the bed. Okay? Not Robert Frost, but still very, very good. But the Silverstein uh, poem, or really story, that really moved me uh, was this one, The Giving Tree, which I bet many of you have heard of. I'm going to summarize, because again, I think you probably know it. But it's the story of a relationship between a boy and a tree that loves him, and which he loves in return. And the pair meet uh, when the kid's just a little guy, and they form a friendship with the tree providing a play and rest for this little boy. And this relationship and the opportunity to give makes the tree happy, which is the refrain of the book, and the tree was happy. Well, as the story goes on, the boy grows up, and he begins to spend uh, more and more time away. But at one point, he returns uh, with the ecstatic tree uh, saying what she used to say uh, when he was just a little guy. Come, boy, come, climb up my trunk and swing from my branches. But the boy, now a teenager, says uh, he doesn't want to play and swing. Rather, he wants money so that he can buy things. And so the tree basically says, I don't have any money, but take my apples and then sell them so that you can buy stuff and be happy, which the boy does. Well, again, the boy disappears, and then he reappears after a long, long time. Well, the tree, again, is ecstatic to be reunited, repeats the offer about uh, climbing up her uh, trunk, swinging from her branches, but the boy, now a man, again says, I don't want that anymore. Rather, he says, I want a house. And then afterwards, he says, I want a boat. So the tree first encourages him to cut down her branches so that he can build a house. And then subsequently encourages him to cut down her trunk so that he can build his boat. Of course, this leaving her a stump. Well, after many more years, the boy, now an old man, returns uh, 
This time the tree sad that she doesn't have anything more to give him. Well, the boy, uh, again, now an old man, seeming really, really beaten down by life, says at this point he just needs a quiet place to sit and to rest. And this heartens the tree, and she responds, Well, an old stump is good for sitting and resting. Come, boy, sit down and rest, which he does. And the last line of the book is, And the tree was happy. And this story moves me, moves me now, moves me back then. And back then... It never occurred to me that there could be anything at all problematic about this story. But just a few years ago, there was a huge cultural dust up about it. Famous psychologist, a guy from University of Pennsylvania, Adam Grant, wrote an article that went viral called, We Need to Talk About the Giving Tree. And in this article, he proposes that the book is dangerous. And this generated a huge wave of people online agreeing, saying the grieving tree is toxic. It's horrible, with some public libraries actually banning it. And of course, others defended the book with equal fervor, saying, hey, this is a beautiful story about sacrificial love. Well, at first, I was offended by the haters. And I thought, who are you to criticize the giving tree? But the more I thought about the critique, the more I felt the point and felt a little bit disturbed. And the reason I felt a little disturbed was because I wondered whether that same critique could be leveled at Christianity with its uh, robust love ethic Because there's at least a surface similarity. After all, as we just saw in our last message series from 1 John, He Became Us, we Christians are called to lay down our lives for each other. So the question that began sort of swirling around my mind is this, is the Christian life with its extraordinary love demand ultimately about becoming a stump? And more specifically, is that what the Sermon on the Mount leads to? And again, it's a fair question because in this famous sermon, Jesus asks us to do a lot of giving. For instance, in the sermon, Jesus says that we are to give mercy. Matthew 5, 7, Jesus says, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Mercy can be hard to give. It can be especially hard to give when the person needing it was decidedly merciless to us two weeks before. And that's just the beginning. In the sermon, Jesus similarly calls us to give love to our enemies. He calls us to give service to the world. He calls us to give resources to those who need them. So it's fair to say that Jesus calls each of us to be a giving tree in a certain sense. But again, to what end? To the end of becoming stumps? Or, this is funny, as one of the 32,000 Amazon reviewers quipped, resting places for people's butts? That's what the person wrote. Well, interestingly enough, in his sermon, Jesus does use the image of a tree to describe the end result of a life of obeying him in love, in the context of relationship. But the picture he paints is anything but a stump. Rather, the picture that Jesus paints is that of a healthy, flourishing tree. A tree that leaves and blooms and produces fruit. And thus the name of our fall message series the flourishing trees. Now, to cut to the chase, rather than being ground down to a stump, the Sermon on the Mount is about becoming a growing, flowering, fruit-bearing tree. Now. That's the promise. 
And therefore, friends, this whole series, which we're going to be in for 14 weeks all the way to Thanksgiving, can be boiled down to one sentence. It will all grow from this root, you could say. The way of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount is the way of flourishing. And that's your first fill-in. The way of Jesus, it's demanding this notwithstanding is the way to flourishing. Now, that may not seem immediately obvious if you know what Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount. Nevertheless, as we will see in his practical teaching, Jesus is offering us a path to our best lives. And not just in the future, but in the here and now. And you could say... In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is answering the same question addressed by everybody from Plato to Oprah. What is the secret to a good life? Now, maybe you're thinking that's a really nice idea. Makes for uh, a, a nice sermon series title. But, but is, it, is it really there? Is that really true to what Jesus is saying? And I want to tell you, that's what I thought when the idea was introduced to me in a book by Jonathan Pennington, who, uh, which I read in anticipation of this series. So let's talk about that. Is it really there? Or is this just uh, what a pastor says? Is it just rhetoric? Let's talk about that. A few weeks ago, a, uh, a European archaeologist announced the discovery of a lost Mayan city. And he found it in a very interesting way. He was flying overhead an airplane using LIDAR, which is airborne radar, and he sees something that looks like an ancient city. And at first, uh, other archaeologists were skeptical because sometimes these lost city claims prove to be overblown, and there's a reason for that. You know, if you are a physicist, your supreme dream in life is to win a Nobel Prize. Thank you, Jim, right? Okay, if you are a pitcher, your great dream in life is to pitch a perfect game. Very good. Well, if you're an archaeologist, your dream is to find a lost city. That's why they get into the business, okay? That's why they do it. Uh, but anyway, uh, the discovery is held up. It's proved to be legitimate, but this is interesting. Right after he announced it, another archaeologist, somebody from Cal Berkeley, by the way, said something interesting. She said that, that the team's next step after making this announcement would be to do some what she called ground truthing. And what she meant by ground truthing was the team would need to parachute out of their plane and with their uh, machetes and their bull whips uh, and their fedoras, whatever archaeologists use, okay, get on the ground and confirm that the picture on the ground matched the picture from the air, all right? Ground truthing. Well, why talk about this? Because here's why. I've made uh, a high up 40,000 foot claim about this famous piece of scripture. Maybe Jesus' most famous teaching, okay? I've said the Sermon on the Mount is about human flourishing, not just in the future, though it includes that, but right now, in the here and now, today. Let's see if the theory holds up on the ground, all right? Let's do some biblical ground truthing, and let's see if there are indicators in the sermon itself that indicates it's about not just something for the future, but good in our lives today. Let's look at how the sermon ends, and you'll see this passage on your handout, and it will come up on the screen. Listen to how Jesus ends the Sermon on the Mount. He says, Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it was founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand, and the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. What do we have here? I mean, just not, not going too deep. What do we have here on, just on the surface? This is wisdom teaching. And in the Proverbs, the house is a stock image for our lives. So what's Jesus saying? It's very plain. He's saying that the, the one who hears and does Jesus' words, by which he very specifically means the words he just finished, the Sermon on the Mount, all their challenge notwithstanding, is the one who thrives, even in times of disaster and catastrophe. That's a practical benefit. Not just something into the future, that's something for here and now. Now again, will the person who devotes him or herself to Jesus in love, as a learner, learning his way, living in love with him for, the, for all of life, will that person experience a, a, an additional kind of future flourishing? Of course. But the future flourishing in no way negates flourishing in the present. That's the end. 
What about the beginning of the sermon? How does Jesus begin it? Are there any indicators there that the sermon is about practical benefit here and now on this stage? Well, as we'll see next week, Jesus launches this sermon by giving uh, nine statements that all start, blessed are. Now, it's really important you stay with me for about two minutes, okay? This is going to be the technical part of the sermon. For two minutes, stay with me, but it's important. When we read blessed here, something comes into our minds. We naturally think of the active bestowal of God's favor on somebody's life, because indeed that's what a blessing is. And therefore, when we read the Beatitudes, we automatically think that Jesus is saying that when a disciple, again, grounded in grace, aims for a poverty of spirit or purity of heart, that in that moment, God automatically throws down some kind of benefit or blessing. Now, that might be true because God's a generous God and he's active in our lives. That's not what Jesus is saying here, though. It might be true in a general sense, and I think it is. It's not the point Jesus is making. Jesus is making a descriptive statement. He's making a statement about the way the world ordinarily works. And Jesus is saying that the natural state, the state you can predict, there are exceptions, but the state that you can predict for people who live in his way is to experience flourishing. Again, we'll explore what that means, but it's flourishing, practical life benefit. And we know this, stay with me, one little technical bit, because the Greek word for blessed here, makarios, one of two words you're going to learn over 14 weeks, two Greek words, makarios, that word is a wisdom word. It's a wisdom word. It pertains to wisdom. And it's analogous to the Hebrew word from Psalm 1-1, which starts out, blessed is the one, which if you know that psalm, you know it's about flourishing. Flourishing. Now, we could go deeper to establish the point, but nobody but Susan Turry and Jenny and Mark Boucher would care. So I'm going to cut it off right here, okay? But because makarios is a wisdom word, evoking practical life benefit, again, having the sense of, uh, right here, fortunate, enviable, prospering, flourishing, a lot of commentary writers, people who study this at a high level, translate the Beatitudes this way, happy are. For instance, happy are the poor in spirit. Happy are those who mourn. Now, happy isn't perfect either because as we'll see, the flourishing that Jesus is talking about is more than just a, a subjective emotional state. But at least happy kind of gets at the practical, real life benefit behind the Greek word makarios and behind the Sermon of the Mount more broadly. Okay, end of technical stuff. Now, why does living by Jesus' way lead to flourishing? Even though it's demanding, even though it's really hard, it can even feel excruciating from time to time in moments. Why? There is a very important reason, and I'm going to save it for next week. But for now, here's the big idea of this message. Here's the big idea of this series that we're going to be in for the next 14 weeks. The way of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount is the way to flourishing. Here and now, it transforms us not into lonely stumps, but joyful, blooming, date-bearing palm trees. Thus, one of the theme verses of this series, Psalm 92, 12, which says, the righteous flourish like the palm tree. That's the promise of the sermon. That's what Jesus the King is saying. And to start winding down, several years ago, uh, my twin brother Darren uh, my sister-in-law, Becky, uh, Allison, and I took a trip to San Diego. Midway through the trip, uh, our sister-in-law, Becky, said, hey, let's take a day to go to Anza Borrego Desert State Park and, and hike around. And I had I'd never even heard of it, uh, but I was ready to go, especially when I heard that the route to Anza Borrego went through the town of Julian, which is famous for its pies, if you've ever been there. And let me tell you, the pies do not uh, disappoint. So anyway, we head out. Two hours later, we arrive at the park. And when I see it, I cannot believe we are still in California, let alone San Diego County. You see, Anza Borrego is it's this desert wonderland. And, it, and to me, it looks more like something you would see in southern Utah than anything you would see in California. Well, anyway, my sister-in-law Becky has a hike picked out. We head out, and it's hot, 
and we have uh, lots of water, and we have food, and we have pie, most importantly, okay, it's a survival food, but it is hot, and I'm feeling a little bit nervous, and so we start to walk, and as I look up, it seems like there is nothing ahead but more desert, and I'm thinking, well, why are we doing this uh, hike, but still we plod on, but I don't know, maybe after two miles or so, almost magically, the terrain begins to change. And a plant here, and a plant there, and a wildflower here, and a wildflower there. And before we know it, we arrive at a cool, shady forest of luxurious palms. Well, we plunk down, we pull out our lunches, and we feast in cool comfort. Why the story? You know, much of what Jesus calls us to in the Sermon on the Mount and in the Gospels more broadly is demanding. <laughs> and admittedly, it feels like the hot desert trail that we took that day at first. And I was reminded of that this week because uh, our our. Life is a family change. New job, new schools, everything's different, requiring more stuff from me, requiring more stuff from all of us. And obeying what I sense Jesus wanted me to do was hard, but did it ever lead to an oasis? <laughs> it really did. And speaking of an oasis, that's what we all together as a church become more and more as each of us flourishes more and more, by each of us leaning into our Lord's words here in the sermon and the Bible more broadly, as each of us more and more lean into Jesus' teaching in love, soaking in his grace more and more, we collectively become what? An oasis. Flourishing trees for spiritual investigators to come and learn about Jesus. And you know what? We are that Already, just a few weeks ago, a brand new hillside, a first-time visitor, told me how much she loved hearing the laughter in the room and in the lobby out here before church started. She said it was music to her ears. Oh, beautiful. We're already an oasis. And you know what? We can become more of one as we all lean into Jesus' teaching and all become more of a flourishing tree. Four ways to get the most out of this series. And I can do these very, very quickly. First, come to church. Come to church. You're here now. Good job. Way to go. Let me tell you something. Hillside services and hillside sermons in particular, they're not interchangeable. They build on each other. They really do. So if you have to miss, I encourage you at least tune in during the week. Listen to the message so you stay in the loop. Second, Use the companion study. Peter Turry does this every single sermon series, developed a brand new companion study for the flourishing trees. It's great. Use it with friends to go deeper into uh, the series. And by the way, my friend Steve Osborne designed the beautiful art. And if you'll notice, it's homage to the giving tree. <laughs> Bravo, Steve. Absolutely wonderful. I love it. Third thing we can all do to get the most out of this series. This may be the most important one. Study the weekly passages with spiritual friends and seek Jesus' voice in them. Gather with spiritual friends in a prayerful and spirit-aware mode at the end of your study. Ask each other, living Lord, what are you calling me to do? How can I follow you? And I would say, if you are still trying to discern a next step in discipleship, make it joining a hillside group. I think it is the most important discipleship habit. It's life enhancing. And you know what else? It's life saving and life preserving. Just write group on your connect card and a next steps team member will help you find a group. And lastly, I love this one. As you begin to put Jesus' teaching into, into place in the power of the spirit, aware of how beloved you are because he loves you. He's embraced you. Expect your life to get better. Expect to see blessing in your own life. Expect your relationships to improve. Expect to become more palm-like than you are now with you and everybody else experiencing the results. 
we have a really great series to look forward to. Let's pray, and then uh, we will get to a final song, and then we'll get to our celebration. Father, you know, thank you for what living in your Son, through your Son, and by your Son's word and way promises. Not just some kind of future good thing, though that's there, but our own flourishing in the here and now. And help us all to grow. Help us all to bloom in the fall season ahead. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.